Amen. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm be honest. I'm trying to discern, uh, uh, but I, I sense the, the Lord leading us to the Word. Come on, stand with me for the reading of the Word today. Uh, it feels good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Some things you can only experience in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. We will <laughs> let y'all in on a secret. We're going we're gonna, to uh, we're gonna get the offering at the end of worship. Um, sometimes you just got to flow where the Lord is leading you. Amen? And <laughs> we, <laughs> we have planned out some things. Uh, we have talked to some things, and it's just all, it's all, it's all shifted by the grace of God. Amen. So, so uh, we're just going to trust uh, that, that you're going to be faithful in your gifts at the end of worship, uh, and we'll trust that you're going to read your bulletins. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say, Pastor, I'm going to read my bulletin. <laughs> Amen. Find out where you need to be uh, in this coming week. The word of the Lord comes to us from two different places in the Bible. I want to go first to John chapter 4. Uh, John chapter 4, and I'm going to pick up here at verse 7. John chapter 4, verse 7, and then we'll jump back to Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47. Uh, this is what the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 7. It's a story about a woman at a well. Y'all remember that story? Anybody know that story? It's a woman at a well. And the Bible says uh, that Jesus uh, was traveling with his disciples, and he had to go to this place uh, through Samaria, the Bible says. And this is what it says, verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, I don't even know you like that. That's my, that's my translation. She said, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked me and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring welling up to eternal life. Now turn with me real quick back to Ezekiel chapter 47. I'm going to read a few verses here that will give us some context. The Bible says, verse 1, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Verse 3, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits or 1,500 feet and led me through water that was ankle deep. Everybody say ankle deep. Ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. Everybody say knee deep. Knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. Say up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a, a what? A what? That I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Amen. You may be seated. I need you to help me title this message. Look at your neighbor and ask him this question. Say, can you help me find this river? Come on, ask him again. Say, can you help me find this river? One more time. I need you to look like you're really lost. Like, like you really need help. And say, can you help me find this river? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. 
It's our prayer, oh God, that my message and my preaching would not be with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that our faith might not rest on Pastor Brian's wisdom, but that it would rest on the power of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you help me find this river? In Greek mythology, there is a story about a man named Narcissus. And Narcissus was a hunter. He was well known for his hunting skill, but he was even better known for his physical attributes, his beauty, his physical nature. So much so that people would follow Narcissus around just to get a glimpse of his physical characteristics. And one day, one of his enemies, who was at odds with Narcissus, he set a trap for him by leading him to a body of water. And when he led him to this body of water, Narcissus glanced and saw his reflection in the water. When he saw his reflection in the water, he was intrigued and drawn to it. So he knelt down by the water just to gaze at his own reflection. There he was for some hours caught up in his own appearance, in his own reflection, in his own image. And, and there he got so caught up that he stayed there for a little while. Hours turned in to days. Days turned into weeks and Narcissus could not pull himself away from this physical image. So much so that he went without food, he went without drink, and he fell in that water and drowned to his death. He had become so enamored with his own image that he could not pull himself away and do what he was called and created to do. Over the last few weeks, we've been in this series called Like God Sees Me, with this desire to see ourselves as God sees us. And if we're ever going to see ourselves the way that God sees us, we must be able to pull ourselves away from the images of ourselves that we have constructed and from the images that this world desires that we would conform to. Did you know the world is trying to conform you in a specific image? The world wants you to have a, a specific style, a, a specific hairdo, a specific smile, because it wants you to be conformed into its image. And we have so long drunk at the wells of this image that has been presented by the world that, that we have now become enamored with it so much so, like Narcissus, we do not pursue our purpose in this world. We don't pursue what God has called us to because we have become so drawn to our own image. And you say, Pastor, no, that's not me. But if we look at our lives and, and the technology that we use, oftentimes they are just by a means by which we can uplift our own image. The things that oftentimes we post on, on Instagram and on Facebook and, and on, on different sites, we, we are trying to conform to an image and, and to see how many people will like what we have posted. Because this image is what draws us closer and closer. And Narcissus here at this body of water, this, this, this water where he sees his reflection, ends up leading him to his death because of a misconception of image. On last week, we talked about a man named David who God had anointed. And we heard the story that when the prophet Samuel went to David's house, he went to anoint a new king at David's or Jesse's house, uh, who was David's father. And, and Samuel thought that surely that God is going to anoint the one who has the best physical outward appearance. And so Jesse thought the same, and he started to parade his sons in front of Samuel. And the first one, the tallest, the most handsome, he came out, and God said to Samuel, this ain't the one. And then he had to teach Samuel a lesson. He said, man looks at the outward appearance. Man looks at the stuff that's on the surface, but God looks at the heart. And so Narcissus had gotten caught up with the external image, and there he drowned in the water. 
Did you know that water can be an agent of death and it can also be an agent of life? If you didn't know, you've seen it over the last few weeks, the last month, as we've watched storms come in uh, to all parts of this world and this country, into Houston and in, into Florida and into the islands and now into Puerto Rico. We've seen the destructive power of storms, the destructive power of water, that water can, can tear apart a region. It can tear apart homes. It can tear apart life. It can be so destructive. But this same substance, this water that has torn apart homes, is the same substance that people are searching after now in some of those same regions because if they could just get their hands on some clean water. That which was destructive can now give life. If I could just get my hands on some, some good water, some clean water, it can give me everything that I need. And so this brings us to this text, uh, this familiar text about this woman at a well. Y'all remember this woman? This, this woman is at a well. We just read about her here in John chapter 4. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus is, is on his way to a certain location. And normally, anybody who was Jewish would make it a point to travel around the region called Samaria because Jews and Samarians did not get along. Samaritans did not get along. But here, the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Look at your neighbor and say, he had to. Come on, tell him he had to. Do you know that sometimes God will take you through places you don't want to go through? <laughs> Can I get a witness? God will take you through some situations and scenarios that you do not want to go through because he wants to do something in you in that season. Can I get one person who can say, you know what, Pastor, I've been there. I've been in some times in my life where God had to take me somewhere and I was kicking and I was screaming, but it wasn't till the other side of it that I began to have a picture of, of who God was and, and what God wanted to teach me and what God wanted to do in me. He had to go through Samaria. The Bible says Jesus comes to Samaria, and the Bible says it is now the sixth hour. In the Bible, time is measured. Uh, it begins uh, at, at 6 o'clock in the morning, so the sixth hour would be 12 noon. The Bible says it is the sixth hour. That means it's 12 noon. This is the Middle East, y'all. It's blazing hot. Look at your name and say, it's blazing out there. It's blazing hot. It's, it's 12 noon. And you see, everybody that comes to the well to get water, all the ladies would come early in the morning. They, they knew how to come at the first hour because then the sun wasn't at, the, at its highest point. They'd come and get their water, and they'd have a little bit of conversation. Then they'd go back and have water, that life-giving source, where they could cook the food and clean the clothes and do all they needed to do. And here it is, 12 noon. And Jesus takes a seat at the well. In his divine wisdom and sovereignty, he knows that there's somebody else who's going to come to the well. Sister girl comes to the well at 12 noon. And she comes because she don't want to be around anybody. She comes because she's dealing with some things. She's dealing with, with some things in her, in her own heart, in her own mind, her own self-image that she really don't want to talk to nobody about. And so she comes at the hottest point of the day when she knows ain't nobody going to be at the, I know I'm going to, ain't nobody going to be here when I get here. I'm going to be able to be alone with my thoughts. I'm going to be able to have some time. I ain't got to worry about the kids. I ain't got to worry about the bills. I'm just going to go to the well at 12 noon and I'll be by myself. And all of a sudden she get there and Jesus say, can I get something to drink? <laughs> How many here know? And the most difficult thing to do when you're going through a trial is to have small talk. <laughs> Woo! I wish y'all would be honest up in here. When you in the, I'm talking about, maybe you ain't never been through nothing real deep, but I'm talking to somebody who's been through some real deep stuff that was cutting you to the heart. And the last thing you wanted to do was have somebody come talking about, did you see the game? She said, I'm going here at noon because I, I'm going here because I don't want to talk to nobody. So she comes and Jesus says, can a brother get a drink? She says, I don't know you like that. And really, your people and my people don't get along. And so you shouldn't even be talking to me right now. Go head on. 
That's Edmonds, Edmonds translation. But Jesus comes back and he says, well, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, <laughs> you would have asked me for a drink. And I'm a get, I, I could have given you living water. Now, now the woman is somewhat intrigued, but she still says, I, I'm smarter than this Jew. I'm, I'm smarter than this man here who doesn't know what he's talking about. He don't even know this well. He's not from around here. You didn't even bring something to draw water with, says the woman. How are you going to get water out here? Are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? Where's your bucket? She's confused. And Jesus responds to her. And he says, basically, I, I don't need a bucket. <laughs> because anybody who believes in me, I will pour in them streams of living water that will well up to eternal life. And then when she hears this, the woman says, show me how to get this water. The woman who didn't want to talk, she, she didn't want to talk at all because she was hurting, she was in pain, she was going through great trial. Now she says, can you show me how to get this water? In essence, I want to argue that these are the words she's saying, can you help me find this river? Can you hear me? She said, can you, can you help me find this, this place of, of eternal water? Watch this, because she has come looking for a well, and Jesus is offering her a river. She, I wish y'all would grab a hold of this thing right here. She has come looking for a momentary fill-up when Jesus has offered her eternal water. He's offered her continuous filling. He's offered her continuous renewal, and she says, can you help me find this, this river? This leads us back to uh, the book of Ezekiel. I, I'm just going to share a few things with you that, that you and I must understand as we gather here for worship today and God has, has met us. He's already here in this encounter. I just want you to understand what God really wants to do in and through us. In Ezekiel chapter 47, what we just read at the beginning of this, this message, the Bible says that Ezekiel, the prophet, uh, uh, the prophet of God, the, the same prophet that had seen a valley full of dry bones and, and God had led him there and, and, and God had called him to speak to the dry bones, the same prophet who saw a wheel in the middle of a wheel, the same prophet who saw, uh, who saw miracles and saw wonders, this prophet Ezekiel now says, a man brought me to the temple. Stay with me. He brought me to the temple, and, and he brought me to the temple, and we saw that there was water coming from under the door of the temple. And so the man, he, he measured off a third of a mile and led me through this water. And we got to a place where the water was knee-deep. Everybody say knee-deep. Then the man, when we were there, he, he, he measured off another third of a mile and he led me to another place further in. And, and now we got to a place, uh, excuse me, first, first place the water was ankle deep. Second place the water was knee deep. Third place, he says, he led me to a place where the water was waist deep. Then he says, finally, this man led me into a river that no one could cross. I want to just lift up the day, this metaphor for you that... The river that Ezekiel speaks of represents the presence of God. And I want you to understand today that oftentimes you and I, we engage in waters that are only ankle deep. I need you to think with me today. But we come to church, many of us, engaging in ankle deep waters. What do you mean? Oftentimes, we can come to church and we can experience the worship, we can experience the music, but oftentimes, in ankle-deep waters, the people that are resting there have not experienced the salvation of the living God. Because ankle-deep waters, they feel good. They, they feel good. They get you a little wet. You know, you go to the beach or you go to the pool and you say, well, I just, I just want to put my feet in, see how it feels. I, I, I just want to take off my shoes and, and take off my socks in this ankle-deep water. But then the Bible says the man led him to waters that were knee-deep. 
And in those knee-deep waters, as, as, as the prophet was there and began to engage, I began to understand that in these knee-deep waters, people are, people are saved and people are, are able to be set free. But the issue with the knee-deep waters is that there is more of me than there is of the water. Are you with me? And so in this level of water, in this knee-deep water, I can experience God. I can come to church. I can lift my hands. I can praise the Lord, and I can say I had a good time. But more often than not, transformation may not occur because this knee-deep water still has more of me than it has of the presence of God. And so I come in, and I come to Macedonia, and I get excited about the knee-deep waters that I engage in, but God has not been able to fully lift me up because I have not surrendered myself in the knee-deep waters. So here I am in the knee-deep waters, and in the knee-deep waters, I don't have to change my clothes. I can just roll my pants up. You're going to get that in a second. I don't have to change everything. I can just roll my pants up, and then when I leave, I can roll them back down. Because I only, I only been in knee deep. When I'm in knee deep, I can still control where I'm going in knee deep waters. You see, but part of, part of what happened in, in, in the moment of worship where we just were was, was the waters got a little bit higher than knee deep. And while me and Pastor Jason had talked about a worship plan and a worship flow, and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him, we had to, we had to figure out where the Lord wanted to carry us in those waters that were knee deep. And then the man said, he took me to a place where now the waters were up to my waist. And you see, what happens when you get in waters that are up to your waist, you have two options. You either have to disregard the clothes that you have on, or you have to choose some different clothes to put on. Are you, are you hearing me on this thing right here? You see, when you try to go in water, I'm talking about you just going to the beach, you going to the pool. If you're just going to put your feet in, you find what you got on, you can roll your pants up, you can lift your skirt up, move it out the way. But when you decide I'm going all the way waist in, I got to say either I don't care about what I have on or I'm going to change my whole attire because I want to be in the water that bad. And God says, when you really want to be in my presence, what you realize is that the water is better and more important to me than what what I've got on. It's better and more important to me than what is external, than what is on the outside. And so I'm willing to get in the water. You see, the waist deep waters, many churches are in waist deep waters. We come and we gather and we experience God. We lift our hands. We worship God. We experience His power. But there's still a considerable amount of us in comparison to the power and presence of God. And so then Ezekiel says, then this man took me further and he took me deeper in the waters and it became a river that I could not cross. A river that, that the only way to navigate it was now to swim because my feet weren't on the bottom anymore. You ever jumped in the water and realized your feet can't hit the, I, I, maybe y'all ain't never been there, but, but I've been there as a young child sometimes getting a little excited. You jump in the water and realize your feet can't hit the bottom. And when you first realize it, you, you get a little nervous, you get a little, you get a little squirmishy because you, you're saying, I want to be in a place where, where my feet can hit the bottom, where, where my feet can, can, can still have a little bit of settling. I can be in control, but God says, I want you in a place where your feet can't hit the bottom. I want you in a place where you are overwhelmed by my love, you're overwhelmed by my grace, you're overwhelmed by my power, you're overwhelmed by my strength, you're overwhelmed by my joy, because when you're in the place where your feet can hit the ground, oftentimes you're in a place of your own control. And so the depth level of the water, watch this, it indicates the level of control that God has in my life, the fervor with which I will seek Him, and the level of trust I will place in Him. And so if I only continue to get in ankle-deep waters, it might mean 
I think God is okay, but I still want to run my life. I still want to do my thing my way, and so I'll come whenever I feel like it. If I decide I'm going to get in knee-deep waters, I'm saying God is good, and I want to worship him, and I want to know him more, but not more than I want to mirror the image that the world gives me. When I get in waist-deep, I'm saying God is getting really good to me, and, and I want to grow more in him, and I'm seeking his face daily, but there's still parts of my life that I'm saying God you can't have I see y'all ain't gonna say nothing right here but I need some honest folk in the house who will say if I'm real honest there are still parts of my life that I have not given over to God there are still parts of me that I have not trusted God fully with and God is saying I love you for your honesty and what I want to do is I want to take you deeper in the water now, I'm almost done. I want you to get this, though. You say, well, Pastor, why, why do we want to go deeper in the water? What, what's going to happen if we go deeper in the water? You can pull up verse 6. I, I just need you to see a couple things here, and then I'm going to let you go. It says, he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. Ezekiel still having this vision. Verse 7, when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And this is where it gets me. Verse 8, it says, this water flows down into the Dead Sea. And when it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Somebody ought to lift it up a praise right there. Now, I've, I've, I've had the privilege, I've had the privilege to travel in the Middle East and to travel into Israel. I've had the privilege to put my whole body in the Dead Sea. And, and I remember what it felt like when that salt water, it, it burned my skin because it was so salty. There is no life that can live in the Dead Sea because the saline content is so high. Now, watch this. The Dead Sea is also at the lowest point of the earth. Did you know that? The Dead Sea is 1,300 feet below sea level, and then its waters are 1,300 feet deep. And so not only are dead things there, but there are the lowest. They're at the lowest point. This is what God says. When the river of my presence meets the dead things in your life, that which is dead has to get back up again. When the river of my presence meets where you are. That's where my power is able to resurrect. I wish I had a few witnesses in here who can say, Pastor, there's been some times where I just had to get into the house of the Lord. I just had to get into his presence because when I got into his presence, that grief that had me gripped, that fear that had a hold of me, that doubt that was living in my mind that had brought me down to a place of death, God was able to raise me up and to strengthen me in his presence. Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, resurrection happens in the river. It happens in the river. It happens in the river. But watch this. Once something is resurrected, let me help you understand this. Lazarus was not resurrected. Lazarus was raised to life. Because Lazarus would die again. Do you hear what I'm saying? Resurrection is bringing something to life that will not die again. That's why Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to be resurrected because that which was dead now had been raised to life, never to die again. And so when resurrection happens, that which was dead is now living not to die. So resurrection happens in the river, but watch this. Living things are nourished in the river. You see, because if once you experience resurrection, if you're not going to die again, you got to have some nourishment. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's why many of us have dreams, many of us have desires that might experience a resurrection, but when we go through a dark season, they die again. That's why you got to keep coming back to the river. Because what time in the river does is it prevents premature death. Time in the river prevents things from dying 
that God is calling to live again. Last thing I'm going to show you here. Happens in the river. Resurrection happens in the river. Living things are nourished in the river. Verse 12. Just pull verse 12 on the screen. I want to show you this. Verse 12 says that fruit trees of all kinds will grow on the banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, neither will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Here it is. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Somebody say healing. healing. Come on, say it again. Say healing. healing. There is a place in the presence of God where we have access to restoration and to healing that can only take place in his presence. Now some may say, Pastor, I, I, I wonder why, why does God heal some and not heal others? I don't know the answer. That God in his divine will and his purposes, he's working all things together for our good. And so in some case, he may call one to go through a struggle while he calls one out of a struggle. But here's what I do know that there are certain places in his presence where when we reach them, we have access to the leaves of healing. We have access to that which will restore us. Let me bring us home here. We said we want to see ourselves like God sees us. And part of the reason why you and I don't always see ourselves like God sees us is because there are emotional and physical places inside of us that need to be healed. If we had some honest folk in the house, there would be some people who would say, Pastor, there are still some things in my heart that need healing from, from that relationship, from, from that grief I was struggling with, from that low self-esteem that I had at that time, from that issue that I was over, trying to overcome. Pastor, there are still some things that I'm hurting from, from my, my, my parents and my friends and family, and that which she said to me, and that what he did to me, there are still things in me that need to be healed. And I've come today to tell you that God is able to heal them. But you got to be ready to get in the river. You got to be ready to step out of your comfort zone into the river of God's presence and say, God, what you have for me, I desire. God says there are broken places and broken spaces in your heart that are keeping you from walking out my calling on your life. And you desire to be whole. You desire to be transformed. You desire to be filled up. You desire to be strong. But God says, I invite you to the river. Here's my question for you today, and I'm done. Can you help me find this river? I'm not asking a rhetorical question. I said, can you help me find this river? Is there anybody here that desires that kind of river? Is there anybody here that desires that kind of engagement? I got about four people. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God is not going to push you in the river. God is not going to force you into the river. But you've got to make a decision that says, God, I want to trust you with my whole life. You've got to make a decision that says, God, I want to seek you with all that I have. And you've got to make a decision that says, God, I'm putting you in control. Don't hear me wrong. These are not easy choices. Because it feels good to be in water that's knee deep. You can leave church and say, oh, I, we, were, we had an awesome time. We were so blessed. Didn't they sing? Didn't they sing? 
He preached. But we was only knee deep. God says, do you want more? The word of God in John 7 and 37 says this. Whoever believes in me. See, in John 4, Jesus said streams. But in John 7, he clarifies and he, he uh, enlightens. He says, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within him. So if we're going to find the river of God's presence, you can't just come looking for the river. But you got to come and bring a part of it with you. You got to come and bring a piece of it with you. It says, when I engage in the atmosphere of prayer and praise and worship, we'll find the presence of God. That's why when I ask, who can help me find this river? I need more than just a few who will commit to finding the place that God has for us. In your quiet time, in your quiet moments this week, I implore you to seek the Lord. To seek his face and say, God, will you take me to that place where I'm willing to trust you in the river? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this moment in your presence. We thank you, Lord God, that you want to lead us to a place that's uncomfortable. You want to lead us to a place that's abnormal, but it's exactly what we need. For in that place, oh God, our wounds will be healed. In that place, oh God, our hearts will be strengthened. In that place, oh God, our minds will be renewed. In that place, oh God, the broken pieces will be put back together again. When we find you in the river of your presence. God, I pray now for my brother and my sister who need more than this world can offer. I pray that you would be tugging on their heartstrings, letting them know that all that we have need of is in the river of your presence. Come on, say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift. And I lift my voice. Come on, some of you know this song to worship you. To worship you. Oh my soul. Oh my soul. Rejoice. Rejoice. Take joy, my king. Take joy, my king. Anybody want God to be pleased? In what you hear. In what you hear. Let it be a sweet. Let it be a sweet. Sweet sound. Sweet sound. In your ears. Come on, let's say it again like you mean it. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And here's what I do. I lift my voice. I lift my voice to worship you. To worship you. Oh my soul. Oh my soul. Rejoice. Rejoice. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take joy. joy my king. Take joy, my king. Come on, 
one more time. Let's lift it up to the Lord with one voice. I love you, Lord. Why I was made worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my king. Take joy, my king. In what you hear. Let it be. One more in this. Come on, anybody that really believes this in your heart, I just need you to sing it out with all you got. Yeah. I got a few more folks who are willing. To worship you. You got to tell your soul what to do. You got to tell your soul to rejoice. Take joy. Take joy, my king. And let it be. Your worship is music to his ears. Won't you just lift up a shout of praise in the house? Won't you lift up your worship? God, we thank you. God, we love you. God, we need you. There's nobody like you. It's in your presence, God, where there's fullness of joy. It's in your presence, Lord God, where there's everything that we need, oh God. And so we call upon you, Lord. call upon you, Lord God, to draw us into deeper waters, to draw us deeper, oh God, that we might find what you have for us. Let it be.